Well, thank you very much, Merritt. It's great to be here. I'm, uh, I must also admit, I'm doubly moved to be invited to give this lecture. First, because <clears throat> this is my alma mater, or across the street over there. Uh, and thanks to Columbia College, uh, I began to think seriously about the uh, things I have thought about for the rest of my life. I programmed computers here, I read John Locke, uh, and lived through the revelations of Richard Nixon illegally surveilling US citizens, all of which are issues that have remained with me to this day. Secondly, it is a lecture named after George Ball, uh, who inter alia, and in addition to what Merritt mentioned here, uh, also was the one American who actually uh, actively helped draft the Schumann Plan, which uh, showed the, shows to this day the strong transatlantic basis of what became the European Union, which along with NATO is one of the greatest political creations of the 20th century. Now, allow me to begin with the paradox. <clears throat> For the past three years, I have lived in the middle of Silicon Valley, considered the world's center of IT innovation. In a 12-mile radius of my office at Stanford, you can find the headquarters of Tesla, Apple, Google, Facebook, Palantir, and YouTube, and countless other companies and commercial services making lesser billions. Nearly all of them provide us with services that we use day in, day out, morning to night, not recalling even that 20 years ago none of them existed and would have seemed utterly fantastical just 30 years ago uh, after the end of the Cold War. Yet if I need to register a child for school or get a driver's license or indeed have any interaction with any level of government, local, state, or national, I usually have to drive to a government office, stand or wait in line, often for hours. Nor is this just California. Just this week, the New York Times published a piece about people waiting for hours to get a, quote, real ID without which you will no longer be able to fly as of October or November. Moreover, given the level of te technical sophistication of the real ID, <clears throat> it too is something from the 1980s, giving no security <laughs> whatsoever. Um, so unlike the wonders of the digital lies that we live with our uh, smartphones and our apps, our public services and means of government, hardly differ from the 1950s and the 1960s. At best, it is occasionally possible to accomplish a government or public service related task online using a shaky and inevitably insecure website based on an email address and an ultimately brute force breakable or hackable password. If my data are stored on a government serv server, I don't know how secure they are or if, as in the case of 23 million past and present federal employees in 2015, um, or as we read yesterday, another 200,000 from the Defense Information Security Agency, which also manages the White House's secure communications, my data can simply be stolen, presumably in both cases by a foreign power. In contrast, in my country, there are only three instances when an individual interacting with the government or public services needs to show up and in person. To get married, to get divorced, you both have to show up at the same time, um, or to transfer physical property, that is sell real estate or buy it. The latter, incidentally, is to prevent anonymous shell companies with dubious, to say the least, owners from buying up real estate, as we have seen happen in the UK, Canada, in the, the United States, including the skyscraper that is the home of the President of the United States these days, where two consiglieri of Russia's leading mafiosa have bought apartments. All other interactions are digitized and can be done online as securely, moreover, as the highest levels of security currently available. In the 19 years we have used this system, we have had no breaches, 
Moreover, our system is set up so that the government may never ask you again for information that it already has, our so-called once-only regulation, which never have to write your address once you've done it once, never have to give your date of birth once you've done it once. Um, your address can change, but not your date of birth. But all of that makes interaction with the government extremely seamless. And I mention all of this, given the other part of my talk, um, with the fact that all histories of cyber war begin with the massive DDoS or <clears throat> uh, distributed denial of service attacks uh, on Estonia by Russia in 2007. Now, as we know, DDoS or distributed denial of service attacks restrict access to servers by flooding them with thousands of near simultaneous queries. They do not, however, constitute a breach nor a compromise of data. Indeed, our e-governance systems remained intact throughout the massive attack on our country. On the other hand, and this is what is, uh, will be part of the second part of my talk, is that if we take Karl von Clausewitz's definition of war as the continuation of policy by other means, then the first public instantiation of using a cyber attack as a policy measure um, defines this as the beginning of cyber war, cyber conflict. Yes, we had things before. We had break-ins. We had moonlight mile or maze breaking into the Pentagon, but none of this was ever, po was ever public. This was a public policy act. Um, so it was the first one. It's, it was hardly the last, and I suspect it will continue. Now, we also know the attack on Estonia is an example of a new form of cyber threat. Cooperation between a nation state um, and in our, the attack on us, the botnets organized by organized crime, because the DDoS attacks were perpetrated by organized crime networks that otherwise up till then had been uh, sending out spam. So what this result has, what this was, was a unique form, uh, but widespread as we know, of public-private partnership. And this is something that we have seen over and over since then. <clears throat> the threats and responses to them I shall deal with in the final part of my talk, but first let me addra address another paradox. Whenever I talk about digitization of governance, I always hear about Big Brother, government surveillance, the KGB, Stasi, Gestapo, and since 2013 and Edward Snowden's revelations, the NSA. These are legitimate fears um, if you don't do digitization of governance right. The paradox is that, as Shoshona Zuboff describes in her book, Surveillance Capitalism, has anyone here read that? Good, 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 great. <laughs> Very long book. Um, all of what people are afraid of when it comes to government pales absolutely pales before the surveillance by all of those same wonders of private sector services and social media searches, social media we use. The collection of data on each and every one of us via Google searches, Facebook, our free apps on our phone. There are no free apps, by the way. Um, uh, and the cookies on almost every commercial website not to mention the location data you give away when you use Google Maps to drive somewhere is simply astounding. Add to that that here in the United States where governance and public services are basically undigitized, you too have new forms of public-private partnerships. The US government is not Big Brother. It does not surveil you. Instead, as we led, read last week, ICE simply buys individuals' location surveillance data from private sector surveillance companies in order to find you. I shan't, though, in this, <clears throat> at this moment, go in 
to this at the moment, but it's important to point out that with all the scraped metadata and digital exhaust we produce that goes into creating highly granular profiles of each of us that tech companies sell for advertising and is the source of their income, you yourself do not know what <clears throat> that information is that they have about you, or who has it, or to whom it has been sold, or who is using it. I shall return to this concept of knowing who is using your data. So how and why did Estonia embark upon this path to digitizing nearly all of government? Well, primarily it was a development, a problem of development as we, as a discipline of SIPA, for example, developmental economics. In 1938, the last full year before World War II, uh, when you could measure things, <clears throat> Estonia and its northern neighbor, Finland, were calculated to have the same GDP per capita. In 1992, the first full year after Estonia's reestablishment of independence, uh, Finnish GDP per capita was 24,000 US dollars and Estonia's was 2,800 US dollars per capita. Uh, that's an eightfold difference and so much for the wonders of communist rule. We, as did the rest of the former communist bloc, um, faced a <clears throat> genuine development prob developmental problem, how to get out of poverty. Additionally, we, as with all developing countries, face Zeno's paradox of Achilles and the tortoise. We'd never catch up because the Finns, the tortoise is for us, and more broadly, the developed nations would forever be ahead of us no matter what we did. For me, the answer of how to overcome this lay in digitization in part because I had learned to code in 1969 as a 15-year-old, so you can't calculate my age, but primarily inspired in 1993 by Mosaic, the first web browser on sale for $29.95 or something like that, um, and then you had to buy it and boot it up with floppy disks, which, as a geek, I did. What hit me, though, was that here was something where we all, the U.S., the Finns, Estonia, Germany, Japan, we were all starting out on a level playing field. Um, this was all exactly four years after Tim Berners-Lee invented uh, HTTP, the Hypertext Transfer Protocol, that is the basis of the internet. But I thought, I knew, I mean, I had, knew inside this would take off and would begin to dominate life because there were just too many things you could do. So from our point of view, sure, the West had its autobahns, interstates, its developed infrastructure in general, but here was something that would be everyone's future, yet gave no one the advantage of half a century of development that Estonia had been left without. At least this was possible if we got on board quickly, which is what I started promoting in the country. Fortunately, we had an enlightened government at the time, and willing to take risks. So when I <clears throat> in um, 1995, when I proposed to a minister of education who supported my proposal to digitize all schools or to put computers in all schools and to connect them all, he took it up and pushed it through the government. By 1998, three years later, all schools were online and had computer labs. And soon thereafter, the banks got involved because they said, hmm, this is a great idea. We have all these villages, we have lots of villages, they're all very small, they all have little, they all have two banks at least, because you have to have competition, but, and you know, they're all based in brick and mortar uh, bank offices. And they said, great, if we can get people to use the internet to bank, we don't have to support all of these buildings. So they kicked in quite a bit of money to get uh, an educational program going that would get, especially among the rural population, people to use computers and in also install computer banks in every little village in the town hall or in the library and the schools and so forth so people could do their banking there. So um, we got to this point 
which is basically where the United States is today, which we're all using um, the standard security methods of a email address and a password. But by the end of the, way, end of the century, it had become clear that digitiz while digitization was indeed a way to develop, it needed to be done differently. First of all, if we were to digitize governance, we needed the trust of the population of a population that had just emerged from a half century of totalitarian control, of police state surveillance, and with disastrous consequences for those whose privacy, in fact, had been violated, and when they, it was discovered, they harbored the wrong opinions. They had experienced all the things that people in the West raise objections to when I talk about digital governance. The challenge was, how do you build a digital democracy? You know you have these tools, but how do you do it? I mean, this, and it's not and never is a matter of technology. That's all there. The question is, politically, how do you do it? And from scratch, and not replicating the paper world in digital form, which consists of basically taking all of your paper documents, or you might as well take your papyrus, from 5,000 years ago, and just making a PDF out of it. That is not digitization. What, co what is the social contract that you have to build with your populace? How can you redo governance that, that since the invention of bureaucracy some 5,000 years ago has always been a serial or sequential process with a document going from one office to the next, to be stamped or signed, or as Steve would know, the interagency process, right? Which is why it takes so long. If you need 15 signatures on a, something to, go, to be sent out for the president to say, at least it used to be that way, now it doesn't matter. Um, it's, it, all, it all takes time and is grotesquely and grossly inefficient. Um, and most importantly, and what I'll speak about briefly, is what, you need, what do you do to establish trust so your citizens are willing to use this? Trust, trust is critical, it is the sine qua non. So what provides trust if you're going to digitize government? First and foremost, transparency. In digitization, what this means above all is you have to know who can look at your data, what's legitimate to look at, what is not legitimate to look at, um, and you have to know who is looking at your data. And then out of that, you can begin to build trust. So very clearly define who, which, which agencies in government can see what, what they cannot see. This is a cultural as well as legal issue. Cultural meaning that in my country, well, your, public, your property records are public. So in Northern Europe, we kind of be like, we tend to be like that. Um, whereas in Southern Europe, when I talk to the Greeks who I'm advising on this stuff, they go, what? People know you can look at what you and politics own or anyone owns? I go, yeah, well, those are the cultural differences. But you have to design your system in such a way that it meets the laws, but also the cultural expectations of your populace. Secondly, you need really good security so that no one can impersonate you, that no one can change your data, that online only you are you. I, uh, I dispensed with showing slides today because it was there not that many I would have shown, but basically you probably have all seen the 1993 New Yorker cartoon where there are two dogs. One is on a chair in front of a computer that was next to him. And the dog behind the computer says, on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. This is the problem of digital security boiled down to its essence. So what are the essentials that we have in the system, which the UN also rates as the most secure in Europe? I should say, while we're rated the most secure in Europe, we are also number one in internet freedom in the world, according to Freedom House, which gives the lie to the idea that you have to give up freedom for security. We have both. Number one in Europe, I would say the Chinese are the best in Asia, and <laughs> the Russians are the best in the rest of Eurasia. 
Uh, but we're the best in Western, in Europe, the European Union. Um, they have a different kind of concept of security in those other countries. What you need to do is <clears throat> you need to give every resident in the country a secure digital identity, unique digital identity. Secondly, you need an architecture that you design, I referred to it a few minutes ago, that is both legal and as well as culturally acceptable to the public on what is private, what is public, along with mutual reciprocal transparency. I can log on and find out who has been looking at my data when it is, I mean, when those are data that can be looked at. I can log on and look at my medical data, but other people, other than the doctor I authorize, cannot look at my data. But in the case of property records, as I found out once a month, the yellow newspapers in my country would check in to see if I own something that they could make a story out of. And you'd say, oh, that guy, OK. <laughs> and finally, okay, you know, what you need then is data integrity, which means that data cannot be changed, which is a far more important issue than privacy, I will argue later. And resilience, meaning that if you are attacked, um, it, your system cannot be taken down for good. And that is why, since the initial implementation 20 years ago, we have had no breaches. The solutions are technological, but the technology can and has changed. The issues that I outlined remain the same. First, identity. Every resident of Estonia has a unique, secure digital identity used to access all government services, be they health records, automobile registration, taxes, social services, property records, and a myriad also of private sector services, first and foremost, financial services. The unique digital identity is used to access all services through two-factor authentication, um, which is, I understand, an optional element here at Columbia, but I don't know why people go along with that, but be that as it may. Using, an, um, through using a chip, either in an ID or in a smartphone, which, of course, is a chip in and of itself. Communication with the certification authority authenticates each and every uh, interaction and allows access to all government and many private sector services through end-to-end -end encrypting. That is, from your device to where you're going, no one can read in between. <clears throat> Using public key infrastructure, which may mean something to you, but public key infrastructure is this uh, uh, form of encryption uh, developed about uh, 40 years ago by two people at Stanford, which the CIA tried to kill, but they didn't succeed. Um, well, they tried to actually uh, not allow the publication of the mathematical paper that underlies uh, public key infrastructure or asymmetrical encryption, uh, but that didn't work either. Um, and so, and the digital identity will allow you to, allows legal signing of documents, which is equivalent to what is called a wet signature, uh, along with a timestamp, which is what makes sure that, ensures that everything is legal. I should add here, and I'm sorry to say this, but the unwillingness of governments such as the ones in the US, as well as most leading highly developed countries to implement the Initial sine qua non of cybersecurity, a unique ID with two-factor authentication and end-to-end -end encryption, means that the most elementary cybersecurity of the public sector and critical infrastructure is doomed. Though the U.S. Uh, though the U.S. Congress values the appearance of security, with uh, because the U.S. Congress, at least for in the case of its staffers, tapes chip decals, that is decals that look like chips, onto the ID cards of staffers at the US Congress. So if you have one of these IDs as we have in Estonia, which has my card here, it has a little chip on it, this is what guarantees my identity, through which I do the two-factor authentication and the encryption. In the US Congress, the staffers get one of these shiny things uh, taped on there as a decal. 
I'm not kidding. I was told by the guy who, that, well, broke it to the press. This is, however, only the first step. The second crucial aspect of our system is the architecture, how you connect the various ministries and agencies and the citizen. This is not a trivial problem. Indeed, it's the most time-consuming task. Building your digital access, data access architecture depends on the, your country's legal, regulatory, in fact, cultural constraints, as I mentioned. The citizen must be allowed to see his data. He must be able to own his data, be they his health records, tax, and property records. But you also need to ensure how agencies can legally access the information that they are entitled to access, but not access what they are not entitled to. That is, the police can look at my traffic records, they can't look at my health care records. Uh, and to ensure that, we key also keep logs of all access, and you can always see, as I mentioned, who's been accessing your data. The key here is transparency for the citizen. As a citizen, I can see who has accessed my data, which largely solved the biggest fear of citizens, the big brother, the big brother problem. You know who's looking where and when and what he's looking at. One more point on the architecture of data exchange. Our architecture, the digital data exchange system called XROAD, is an open source, non-proprietary platform that has now been implemented to one degree or another by 15 countries. In the, to the, <clears throat> today, this platform that we invented in, 19, in 20, 2000, sorry, Estonians and Finns can take out their medical prescriptions in any pharmacy in the other country, not, as well as in their own country, obviously, where it works anyway, but, um, but if a Finn comes to Tallinn, as 8 million do every, every year, and there only are 5 million Finns, but we get 8 million Finnish visits, and they come there to have a good time, and, you know, you have a good time, you lose your medicine. If you lose your medicine, you can call your doctor or write your doctor in sort of northern Finland, up in Lapland, and he'll, like, say, okay, more medicine, and then you go to any pharmacy in Estonia, stick in your ID card to identify yourself, and you get your medicine. That was a big mess. By the way, it took about eight years to get it there, not because of technology, but because different countries subsidize different medicines for, to different degrees for different age groups, and to avoid the problem of arbitrage between two different countries within the single market, if that makes sense to you, at least some of you know something about Europe. Um, <laughs> That took a long time. So um, I submit this is the wave of the future and would begin to take the public services to the ease of operation in the private sector, connecting services across borders and doing so on a highly secure interoperable platform. Uh, I believe over the public's widespread emphasis on, if not paranoia about, misses the real issue. Data integrity, the third pillar of trust and security in public services. We have failed all over to pay enough attention to the issue of data integrity. Yes, privacy is important, and you would be right to be concerned if someone accessed your health care uh, records or your bank account. Well, what if someone changed your health care record? Your blood type, for example. And then you end up at the doctor's, and it's, you've got the wrong blood type in your medical record. Uh, or someone changes your bank account, probably not for the better. What if, <clears throat> so we should all be far more concerned about data integrity than we generally are, uh, which is something we became concerned about. And as of 2008, which is 12 years ago, we began to put all of our public data of any remotely sort of sensitive stuff uh, on a distributed ledger, also known as blockchain, but a permissioned one, that is, this is not like Bitcoin with millions of people going off and having to sign off. And it's a permissioned blockchain, which a limited number of authorities, and in your data case, you yourself have to give permission for something to be changed. And so, the population registry, health, property and court records, tax and pension records are all secured, as is the legal system, or the, rather the court 
cases and laws, because once you go digital, as we did, what happens if someone goes, hacks into your, hacks into your government system and changes a law that you passed? We don't publish our laws on paper anymore. We just put it online. So it has to be, we have to maintain the integrity of our laws, or even in the case of court cases, because court cases, you might have a precedent-setting court decision. <laughs> we don't publish the court cases on paper. So you better be sure that someone hasn't gone back in there to change what could be your entire legal system through a change in the court case or court decision. And finally, one of the weirder things we do, some words on resilience. Estonia is a small country that in the past thousand years has been invaded on an average of twice a century, right? Estonian here nods, he agrees. <clears throat> Last century we were invaded six times. Um, similarly, countries in seismically active areas are also vulnerable to destruction of their data. So in Japan, after the Fukushima tsunami and the subsequent meltdown of the nuclear reactor, lost some percentage of its national data that had been stored digitally. A small amount, yes, but any amount of any loss of national data is unacceptable. Now, a highly digital country is um, even more vulnerable, yet there are creative solutions. So based on the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Immunity and Extraterritoriality, or as I call it, the Assange Convention, um, well, I mean, that's what it is, Estonia now has a data embassy in Luxembourg uh, with a 24-7 dedicated online real-time server that Luxembourg treats as an embassy. No one can enter it, it is secure. But if anything ever happens in country, in Estonia, our critical data, the same health, property, and court records, tax and pension records are that are secured in a, in a distributed ledger in Estonia are also up to date and at the standstill moment of the invasion will be in Luxembourg. Uh, and will be safe, at least until someone also invades Luxembourg. Of course, large countries without serious seismic or security threats have fewer worries, but for smaller countries like mine, our resilience is, needs to be taken care of. Um, now, let me move on to security. Estonia has done all these wonderful things, yes. You can read all about it in a New Yorker article that was published in December of 2018, one of those long New Yorker articles that are so wonderful to read. If you Google, the New Yorker, and then on the same Google line, write The Digital Republic. You'll find this or article that, is, that gives a fairly good overview written by someone who was originally very skeptical, but ended up agreeing. But I want to talk now about, and end up talking about, the threats that we face today, not as a single country, but more broadly. In the digital era, borders have lost much of their meaning, and with that, so too, many of our traditional concepts of security. The traditional face we, threats we face in the digital era threaten all of us in the 21st century. So let me conclude by talking about security in this new era we live in. NATO remains the backbone of hard security in the transatlantic space. Yet if we look at the new threat landscapes uh, that have come up in, with digitization, especially in the last decade, the, as we have seen <clears throat> in the case of Russia alone, and Russia is hardly the only actor here, it potentially can and the potentially destabilizing attacks of one kind or another that have already taken place on almost every country in NATO. We have, in the form of APT 28 or 29, or Fancy Bear and Cozy Bear, the hacking of US, German, Dutch, and Italian foreign ministries of the German Bundestag and the US Congress on the servers of political parties, think tanks, of the Democratic National Committee in 2016, of the server of Emmanuel Macron before the election of 2017, and to top it all off, even the server of the of WADA, the World Anti-Doping Agency, all attacked by these same people. Disinformation, which is another form, uh, 
from the so-called Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg, which is owned by Yevgeny Prigozhin, who also owns the, the Wagner Mercenary Company, active in the Donbass, Syria, and the Central African Republic, and probably elsewhere, has inundated and exploited divisions in virtually all of Europe and the US. Anti-vaxxer disinformation in Italy, the anti-Catalonia Catalonia actions in Spain, organizing anti-Islamic demonstrations in the US, as well as, in the same time and same place, counter demonstrations to the anti-Islamic demonstration in Texas. These are all new forms of warfare. From a weak, ad weak adversary's position, all of this makes sense, actually. Invasions and occupations are extremely expensive, especially for a country with the GDP of Italy. But if you can destroy NATO and the EU through election manipulation, disinformation campaigns, and bribery, it's far, far cheaper. Elect a few anti-NATO candidates, such as Marine Le Pen, to whom Russia lent some $10 million recently, or last election. Fan anti-NATO sentiment in the Czech Republic or Bulgaria or the Baltic states using disinformation campaigns, and you don't have to drive tank columns through the Fulda Gap. You really don't. NATO will, with sufficient effort, fall apart on its own and through its elected governments. So too will the European Union, which has also been a, uh, has faced the, the goal of, of vociparation and separation. Indeed, you don't want to invade Europe, because where would you launder the vast sums of money you fear to keep in your own country? <laughs> Much better to have friendly, anti-EU, anti-NATO governments that also respect your private property, your villas in San Moritz, mansions in London, condos in Miami, or Manhattan's Trump Tower. All the afore aforementioned, by the way, are true and real. The problem that security in the liberal democracies faces today is that the primary historical, indeed even prehistorical determinant of force, which is just hitting someone or throwing a rock, and this is already, you don't, it can be even pre-hominid, the kinetic formula force equals mass times acceleration, which you may remember from physics in high school, no longer applies, because neither time nor distance has any meaning in the digital world. Even if you take apart the formula. Mass, there's no mass. Acceleration, distance divided by time squared, no time. So distance is irrelevant. I mean, it all becomes useless and meaningless. You can take out infrastructure, hack and docs, and embarrass democratic leaders and candidates and flood social media with disinformation or simply bribe eager amoral politicians as we have as we have seen as well and maybe continue to see as valery gerasimov chief of the russian general staff has argued all these measures form a continuum of warfare all short of the kinetic though useful also in kinetic while pursuing kinetic forms as we have seen in ukraine we, on the other hand, <clears throat> both in government and elsewhere, compartmentalize, approach these threat vectors as silos, as if they were separate departments in the university, where there is little contact between those, between various disparate disciplines. I would argue that while the need for NATO and hard security has hardly disappeared, we need to abandon strictly geographically based security thinking. If Seoul, Sydney, Tallinn, Paris, and Washington are separated by microseconds, a geographical North Atlantic Treaty Organization so established because of tank and troop, transport logistics, bomber and fighter range, that's no longer enough. In fact, we have a two-dimensional problem. One dimension, called the vertical, is that these different realms, the administratively and intellectually siloed approach that fails to see digital informational threats as a continuum and do not communicate with each other. We have agencies and institutions that deal with cybersecurity. Some institutions and NGOs, especially in Europe, that deal with disinformation. And we have law enforcement agencies that to 
varying degrees of success de deal with money laundering, bribery, and more violent crime in the case of poisonings, assassinations, etc., on our territory. When all of these turn out to have the same source as they seem to have, um, all related mainly to the GRU, um, then we have to realize that we are facing uh, very disparate things, very disparate attacks coming from a well-integrated adversary. The second dimension of the problem today lies in our pre-digital, nationally-based response to threats. Each allied country <clears throat> approaches digital, informational, and criminal threats on its own. With the exception of Five Eyes, the signal intelligence sharing agreement of what uh, Churchill called in his history the English-speaking peoples, uh, New Zealand and Australia, US, Canada, and the UK, um, information is shared. Um, but otherwise, there's little communication and cooperation in the digital world or in the informational space. And this is one illustration of this, is when uh, we discovered in our military net a, a worm from Russia. We went and told NATO headquarters, and the NATO response was, oh, you too. This is not what NATO should be doing. This is not cyber, this is not defense. Uh, this is not how you do cybersecurity. So what I would propose for, the, <clears throat> for security in this new world that we are living in is a fundamental re rethink of what security means today and how the liber liberal democracies under threat from various algorithmic authoritarians and <clears throat> uh, regardless of where we live geographically, we begin to take these threats more seriously. But this all begins with democracy at home, in our own countries, where we need first and foremost to make our government governance secure and, de and democratic and digital, including governance of our private sector, ensuring the privacy, well-being, and security, this privacy, well-being, and security of our citizens. Thank you. I invite you. After this for after this conversation, we'll be moving into the Nigelo Roden Digital Futures Forum that will be specifically taking up these issues of security, identity, and development, uh, and also data governance. So I hope you will stay uh, for that further discussion. But before that, let's take a few moments and answer some questions that you may have of President Ilvis. And let me open it up and collect a couple of questions. Sir. One of the questions I have is, uh, we have a problem of scale uh, Disparate uh, uh, constituencies. Of course, there is the ever-present uh, uh, freedom uh, movement, which is ill-informed, according to you. So now, how do we get, uh, uh, you know, the United States government to think about, or the people in the United States to think about things in this way? Thank you. Let me collect another. If we have uh, others on the side, it's a question of scale. Uh, yes, uh, there's a mic right there. I had the privilege of um, being in Estonia, spending a full day at the Estonia in 2018, wrote an article in Forbes about it. Um, you look at what Bernie Sanders is trying to do with health care in the U.S. I look at the bureaucracy in American health care. People say, oh, it can't be done. Um, it'll cost a fortune. But then I see what Estonia has done, and I think it's conceivable to do it. And I'm just curious your thoughts about that. Yeah. And one third question, sir, right here. If you. So you scale solving our health care and the third. Right. I got it that way. Yeah. <laughs> oh, um, Mr. President, I don't know if you know, but uh, in Ukraine we have a new president who I has know all about it. Yeah, <laughs> uh, who has a very big initiative about the state and smartphones. So he wants to bring all the uh, government 
government services into smartphone, like you can open your uh, business account, or you can open your bank and uh, get your driver license. Do you think it's secure to do something like that uh, at the time when we are at war with a uh, much bigger, much larger cyber force like Russia? And the uh, uh, second question, which adds up to this, is uh, we he also wants to open up the land market the agricultural land market, which makes up 72% of the Ukraine's territory. And, do, and he also wants to have an uh, open uh, 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 database for that digital one as well. Do you think it's secure as well to open uh, the land market at that time and have uh, the uh, data database, which is online? Thank you. OK, scale. Yes, it's probably easier, but the problem, I don't think, is j just simple scale. I mean, you can, you can scale just by having more server space. The problem comes in at a certain critical mass or critical size. It is, becomes easier to govern in a federal system. So Germany, the United States, Canada, Brazil, Mexico are all federal states with different competences at, for different things at different levels. So in the United States, okay, your federal taxes are one thing, your state taxes are another, banking is regulated by the state. Figuring out the, the competences is where it gets hard, but the actual, otherwise it's server space. Mexico has, in fact, Mexico has were embarked during the last administration to digitize, use the same I mean, the, the architectural software that we developed in Estonia and adapted toward a federal state. But when I was there, I was there the last day of the previous administration, and I asked the person who was doing it what would happen next, and she says, I don't know, five o'clock, I close the door and lock it, deposit the key, and I have no idea what's going to happen next. So maybe someone from Mexico knows something here, I don't know. Healthcare, well, I mean, we digitized our healthcare records. That made it, I mean, that saves a lot of money, right? Administration becomes much easier. We are smaller, yes, that makes it easier to do than with large systems. We do have, I mean, our hospitals are privately owned, but the, but the we, I guess what you would call it, I'm not an expert on this, but a single payer system. So you actually have a solidarity based Healthcare tax, everyone, I mean, everyone pays 13% of their payroll for healthcare, and that is how we finance it. And it works, what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> um, on Ukraine, well, on land sales, I don't know. I mean, we didn't have that problem. We, we had private land since, as far as we know, so. My family owned the farm that I own in Estonia since 1763, which means that you know we kind of have this concept. And there was some grumbling by the former sort of former co-host chairman about, well, we don't really shouldn't have private property, but that went away, uh, especially when they started buying up the land themselves for their <laughs> for their agribusiness. But that's what happens. That will happen. But um, otherwise, I know that Estonia. I mean, I'm not there anymore at this point, but Estonia is actively engaged with all of, uh, I mean, every, almost every ministry is involved with its counterparts in Ukraine on promoting digitization of whatever it is that one or the other ministry does. Thank you. Well, let's collect, I'm gonna ask the last question, collect one more here. Yep. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Let me ask you. I think there's a microphone, if you'd like. I'd like to follow up on one of the points that you made at the beginning about trust. One of the things that troubles me, and it's become more and more pervasive as the political environment here has changed, and you certainly witnessed that, is that we, we really suffer from a crisis of mistrust, distrust. That it's not only that people differ from one another, it is that there is a general notion or an accusation that news is fake, that people make up facts to suit their own needs. And if you get to the point where the American public simply can't trust anything anyone is saying, uh, 
then lies are in effect in the public discourse equivalent to truth because people can't sort out one from the other. And it strikes me that, you know, a, a, Jefferson said a well-informed democracy is critical to the success of a democracy. If it's poorly or ill-informed and it simply doesn't know what the facts are, can't sort out lies from truths, equates them all with uh, irrelevancies because they can't sort one from the other. How do, you, how do you restore that? How do you run a democracy in that kind of environment? Um, in the back, one last question. We're having, a, I'm, I'm sensing an urgency in the room, which is great. So we'll keep going a little bit, if you don't mind. Your Excellency, thank, thank you very much, Niall McCann, United Nations. Um, I'm thinking, related somewhat to that last question, I'm thinking of other countries close to the lower end of the Human Development Index that might look to digital transformation as a way to catch up in the way that you managed to catch up with, with Phil and all those years ago. But I'm thinking of states, I hate to name ones, but name a country like Bosnia-Herzegovina, where there is simply no common political vision in the country about where they're trying to get to politically, where there is no common vision about loyalty to the state or even the viability of the state in the long run. Do you think it was easier for you because you're small in terms of 1.3 million people and that you, you had a reasonable collective vision about the, the loyalty to the Estonian state as an independent entity? Or do you think it was actually easier for those, you have a sizable language minority in your country, do you think it was actually easier to get those people to have more loyalty to Estonia as an independent entity because you digitized and because you, you built this transparency into your digital uh, ID system? I, I, I wish I could say I do, but I don't. I think one of the things that distinguishes all three Baltic countries from the rest of the post-communist world was that uh, there was a period of independence that went through the all of the same problems uh, that the countries you mentioned have gone through since 1989-91, well, mainly 91, because then you had all these new countries. The thing that Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians realized that, all right, we, didn't, we were all annoyed at the bad politicians and the way things were done, but it wasn't so bad compared to mass deportations. And so we ended up with this vision of like the state as this wonderful thing. And so there was a lot of, there was a huge amount of loyalty. The other factor, which I think also answers partially is one of the questions about trust, is that, that in the United States, you make a distinction, I mean, you do not make the distinction between who is running it and what the government is. Whereas in the sort of European sense, like the government or Regierung in German, it's like, it's the cabinet. And then the other stuff works. This is German's probably the best example because the other stuff works no matter who is Bundeskanzler. Uh, and we've sort of gotten there. Uh, you know, we have, a, I mean, there is no love uh, really for the people who are running, who are the prime minister or the different ministries but people really like the system. And that is the difference. So that people will say, oh, this is this, this United States. I mean, I have all these Estonians that have slowly been moving back to Estonia from Silicon Valley because they're like, oh, nothing works here. This is ridiculous. Let's go home. It works there, right? I mean, not make, don't make them much money, but it works. Um, so that this trust in the state is built up and it is kind of a bootstrapping operation. When you start having things that work, people start trusting the state. Um, they still will hate whoever is the prime minister and the president, but they will trust in the state and develop a strong sense of, or at least some sense of patriotism that is often missing in many other countries. Thank you. Sir. Thanks for such a thoughtful talk this afternoon. Uh, I'm J.M. Porp, a cybersecurity reporter in New York. On the subject of trust and data integrity, in 2018, Estonia had to replace three quarters of a million ID cards because of a cryptographic flaw. Something like that is almost certain to happen again. Is it wise to use such a potentially flawed system for things like voting and healthcare? Well, it wasn't three quarters of a million, A, but, I mean, this was, 
This was a chip flaw in the chip. And basically, we discovered it beforehand, or we were told it beforehand. Uh, and we, with the exception of a small number of chips, simply did an update. Now, I mean, the pro what you have to understand is that voting, healthcare, all those things are all done by a one system. So it doesn't really matter to talk about, is it, I, mean, either, I mean, either you have it or you don't have anything. There is no such thing as, oh, healthcare should be taken out. The voting system is something that people go, oh my god, you're doing internet voting. Well, actually, it's the same ecosystem we have used for everything, and on a daily basis, bank transfers, and there's never been a problem. Whereas an election you have every two years, so we don't, we're not really worried. Um, I mean, yeah, this is going to be a problem. It's just that so is, <laughs> I mean, for, so, and even more so, I would agree, is even something as silly as having voter registration, which to me seems extremely undemocratic. I mean, we have a population registry. You are or you are not a citizen if you live in the country. There is no way that you can, oh, we're, not, we're gonna deregister because this person or the 20,000 people who have not voted in the last three elections will now be deregistered. What kind of nonsense is that? You're a citizen, you have a right to vote, right? I mean, not. So I mean, if you were to talk about manipulation of elections, there are far more egregious ways of doing it in an undigitized state than in a digitized state where you know who's in your state. In the United States, only Oregon actually has a population registry where you can avoid this, this ridiculous thing known as voter registration. Well, thank you. Uh, let me collect two more questions. Sir. One. So on a similar note to the question about uh, security, Thank you. So in a similar vein to the question on um, the security of the system, um, you talked a lot about the importance of architecting um, a digital government system correctly. But I'm curious about um, you know, the role that think, uh, thinking about the future played in that. You know, if, um, you know, just to pull a couple examples from your talk um, and your responses, if you know, for some reason Estonia were to, shift to, were to want to shift to a federal system of government, or if it were discovered that uh, you know, Russian hackers were somewhere deep within the system. Is there uh, flexibility to re-architect the system? And is that something that you know, states that are going down this path should be um, actively considering? And let me ask one further question. Um, you know, you started to speak to uh, the degree of cooperation that does exist among the five eyes. And of course, that's great uh, uh, to have that degree of cooperation, but that is not sufficient even, uh, you know, in today's world at all. Uh, and so I'm hungry for your ideas on actually where can we take this further? How do you think we can take this further when it comes uh, to uh, cyber cooperation in, you know, a, a world with very differing degrees of tolerance around uh, the use of these kind of surveillance, security, privacy issues, um, and uh, a high degree of urgency. All right, on the first question, and basically, uh, if you want to look, I mean, you can watch a three and a half minute video, go on YouTube, write X hyphen road, long version, the long version is three and a half minutes, uh, but basically, there is really, you, the worst you can do is destroy an individual cell because everything is so compartmentalized that, first of all, I mean, either I mean, you can access one person's data in one area, you can't access more than that. Um, and that's all because the authorization requires uh, both identifying yourself and also exactly what you can look at restricted by what you, and you can't do massive searches. So that, that reduces, it's kind of like the Exxon Valdez, you know, the world's largest oil tanker about 20 years ago went aground and it's ma ma most massive oil spill in er ever. But since then now oil tankers have compartments. <laughs> Good idea. So if you actually run aground, you'll lose one compartment. And so if you think of this, that kind of like to a, to an altogether different exponent, then you actually mean that you're, you're fairly unvulnerable. 
Uh, de -ar I mean, re-archiving, fine. I mean, actually, what I didn't talk about, because it was really running out of time and spoke way over, but I mean, the system that we have that, uh, is something which, that's old tech. I think there are new solutions. I mean, I think when it comes to ID, we'll probably be moving on to a sovereign self-identity system. Uh, we'll probably be doing something much more cloud-based than we have right now. That'll be more versatile to use, you know, to get into using uh, open data. But that has to always be done from the point of view of security. Now, on the cybersecurity point of view, I would argue that, well, I don't know. I mean, basically, I don't see much movement on the part of Five Eyes right now. What I, do, what I think is politically doable, if there's enough pressure, is to get the European Union away from this ridiculous idea that was originally killed by the Gaul of a, of a European army. In this current form, it's called PESCO. Whatever PESCO stands for, I don't know, because it's all I find it. We don't need a parallel army. We really don't. Especially when the threats, the biggest threats to, the Europe, to European countries and to the European Union are in the realm that I talked about. And rather, and the, this is the ideal place to actually create on a transnational, multilateral basis the kind of security architecture that we all desperately need. I don't see U.S. leadership in this for the present, at the present time. In fact, relations between the United States and Europe have never been this bad since World War II. So, I mean, what can you do? Uh, but I would say that Europe does not need its own tank army, but it should create its own cyber defenses. And that could be something that we could contribute for as Europeans that later on could bring in not only the United States and Canada, but also all the other liberal democracies. New Zealand, Australia, South Korea, Japan, Uruguay, I mean, kind of candidates that would come to mind almost immediately. Well, thank you so much. We are immediately moving into a, uh, a, a much more specific discussion around uh, cyber peace and uh, governance. Uh, with a great group of experts, and I know President Ilves is staying with us as well, so we'll continue this dialogue. But, but before doing so, please join me in thanking him for